So good afternoon, what time the first? Uh, we are starting again our activities uh, of the workshop on the public commission. We will have uh, two talks from Carlos Ferraz and Marco Azevedo. And then we, we have uh, some time for debate. Uh, Carlos Ferraz is a professor at the University Federal of Pelotas and uh, is specialized in, in Kant, Kant's philosophy. And now it's starting for some years now to study issues uh, related to philosophy of mind. And today, uh, Carlos will uh, introduce us to some new perspectives relating Kant to this uh, uh, contemporary issues. So, Carlos, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, thank Sofia for this invitation. It's a real good, great ple pleasure to be here. And uh, as she told, she told you, um, what I'm trying to deliver here is a paper in which I try to investigate some of these uh, issues related to uh, embodied cognition and extended mind, having Kant as a background. Uh, when I start to write this paper, I uh, did not have the intention to work using Kant. But uh, since, since I start to investigate these issues, I think that Kant has a lot of a lot of things to say about it. It's, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting point of view to investigate these issues, having Kant as a background. Of course, some of my friends, Kantian friends, would banish me for <laughs> of the Kantian society by reading, uh, writing this text anyway. But um, I think it's a, a good approach, and it's a way to show that Kant is not uh, that uh, uh, it's not. It's not uh, in the past. I mean, uh, you can use Kant nowadays investigating issues uh, related to many fields and uh, uh, with the cognition, uh, embodied cognition um, issues. So I will deliver this paper uh, to you, and uh, and after it, uh, you probably have a lot of questions about this approach. Uh, so. A sort of proto-embodied theoretical cognition we might find in Kant's epistemology. In despite of his well-known rejection of the approach made by John Locke, which Kant criticized in his Kritik der Heinefernunft in the context of its analytic of concepts at the core of the deduction of the pure concepts of understanding, Kant does not reject a physiological perspective at all. In the aforementioned part, of the critic that uh, Heine Pernut, Kant is, at any rate, clear about what exactly he, he rejects regarding Locke's point of view. He says, a deduction of the pure, a priori, a priori concepts can never be obtained in this manner, to wit, the manner Locke did in, its, in his essay. That is because such physiological derivation concerns a question facti, which means it cannot strictly be called deduction. And as it is very well known, Kant was looking for a deduction, that is, for a question iuris, for a rational justification for the theoretical use of the categories of the understanding. So certainly Kant himself rejected Locke's physiological derivation, but if you pay the due attention to what Kant says in the transcendental aesthetic, we will acknowledge that Kant did not give up the physiology altogether. In it, we may find some arguments against the mistaken idea of a nativist Kant. Surely Kant was not himself an empiricist, not, not a sensationist, strictly, strictly speaking. I think Kant was in between. He was neither an empiricist nor a nativist. An, in, an in, interesting way of setting it forth is by using a more up-to-date language. According to the current image regarding the mind, it works like it works like devices such as computers. 
So we have inputs, a processing of these inputs, the information processing, and an output. But the point is that Kant was not a classicist. In the Kantian perspective, mind does not only mirror the world. It is not a mere passive retrieval device. Even using that up-to-date language expressed in computer, computational concepts, we may think that not only in terms of problem-solving computational operations, the organism's internal cognitive process involves not only computation and uh, representation, but it, it, it is also molded by its relation with the environment. In other words, through the input, the information gets into the system, which causes a chain of events inside the device or mind. That is the processing itself taking place. At the end of the same process, we have the output. Nowadays, the philosophers of mind would call these inputs propositional attitudes. Yet, speaking in a Kantian fashion, the input would be called sensation, sensatio while the output would be called the theoretical cognition. And given this analogy, Kant will sustain against both the empiricist and the nativists that at the first moment we do not have innate ideas, we do not have sensations only either. That is because there must be an order in which that data must be given to us. So in order to understand Kant properly, we must pay attention to the fact that for Kant, the sensor sensory motor experience is a compound of sensory stimuli, information, and order. That would say matter and form of cognition. It means we are not utterly passive recipients of raw data data. We are active agents in this process. There is no order in nature itself, according to Kant. I mean, at least we, as human beings, are not allowed to know that. On that account, the order ought to be in the agent, in his, her mind. In, and I'm quoting Kant here, he says, in so far as the mind is affected in a certain way. End of quotation. And mind here is gemüt. Uh, and mind is firstly affected, as Kant says, in the order of time. Therefore, we have no knowledge antecedent to experience, and with experience, all our knowledge begins, end of quotation. Thus, in the beginning lies the sensation, and it always occurs in the framework of time and space, the pure forms of all intuition. But these very ideas or forms, to put it in the Kantian way, are not ready for us to use them. That is, they are not given innately in our minds. Anyway, they are not given in sensations either. What is innate is, as Kant says, the formal character of the subject, in virtue of which, in being affected by objects, it obtains immediate representation, that is, intuition of them. End of quotation. The pure forms of intuition are then part of the formal character of the subject, being this formal character the way we are constituted. Kant gives us some clues to understand that, as when he says that we know nothing but our mode of perceiving them, a mode which is peculiar to us and not necessarily shared in by every being, though certainly by every human being. In sum, our nature is so constituted that our intuition can never be other than sensible. That is, it contains only the mode in which you are, we are affected by objects. But the point is that the cognitive process is not fully inside our heads, in our genius, as Kant may, say, may have say. It seems defensible that Kant outlined some ideas that might be corroborated by the performing embodied cognition, in despite of his untenable metaphysical foundations. Anyway, having this background regarding Kant's epistemology, we may now surmise that there is a missing key idea in Kant's philosophical approach to it, the idea of evolution. Even though he himself seems to recognize the importance of the way we are, we are constituted in order for us to have cognition, he could, no go, he could not go any further. 
In event, I think we must go one step further and try to examine some of Kant's ideas in the light of evolution as well as the idea of an embodied cognition in order to comprehend how cognition, theoretical and practical, occurs in our minds. So far, I, will, I, was, talking, I was talking about the theoretical cognition, but what about the practical cognition? Well, I believe cognition, both theoretical and practical, has only one root. Keeping Kant's philosophy as our background, it will be quite enlightening to pay attention to what Kant understood by Gemüt, which is usually translated as mind. The point is that mind suggests a kind of theoretical activity, activity, a speculative. It seems like we are talking about a theoretical feature only, but in fact, Gemüt refers to the whole of our faculties, and all the higher faculties are these ones. Here I'm quoting Kant, he says, in the critique of the judgment. The faculties of the mind, Gemüt, namely, can all be reduced to the following three. Faculty of cognition, restricted to the faculty of understanding, feeling of pleasure and displeasure, which refers to the power or faculty of judgment, and faculty of desire, related to reason. Each of them has a distinct principle, lawfulness, purposes, purposelessness, and purposelessness that is at the same time obligation. And a precise, precise field of application, nature, art, and morals, respectively. So mind is not only a faculty of theoretical knowledge, it is also the faculty that allows us to comprehend the wholeness, I mean, the world, world in a broader sense, in a sense which may to enfold the theoretical as well as the practical meaning of this same world, understood here, therefore, as wholeness. Those higher faculties, constitute what Kant understood as, my, as mind, gemüt. Hence, mind is a many-sided threat. It enables us to apprehend the wholeness, giving this world a full meaning. On that ground, I am now interested in investigating the possibility of a practical embodied cognition, the kind of cognition that cemented the road directly to ideas such as the ideas we may find in morals especially the idea of wholeness, which is closely related to the idea of God. As a matter of fact, I borrow the idea of a practical cognition from, from Kant, but I will give it another perspective. In his groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, in its preface, Kant all of the sunder, all of the sunder refers to a practicing erkentness, a practical cognition which sounds quite strange if you have in mind that until this work, cognition was, was, properly speaking, theoretical, for the reason that it was limited to those boundaries established in the Critique der Heinen Vernunft. How could he now, in 1785, just say that there is such kind of cognition? Well, it's not my aim here to explain why Kant described moral laws as cognition, which must have something to do with the idea that the moral law is, as theoretical cognition is, objectively valid. It is not a matter of faith, nor even of opinion. It is a kind of cognition that lies on a different foundation. But in, by any means, what I want to investigate here is what if we try to explain it in the framework of the Darwinian perspective. So. What if we, are, we conceive this practical cognition in terms of the evolution as well as in terms of the advances achieved by the philosophy, philosophy, philosophy of mind, such as the very idea of an embodied cognition or the idea of an extended mind? So let's take for granted that Kant was right about that. In the practical field, we have also a kind of cognition, a practical one. The point is now to show that this, this is a natural process, a process that involves nature. In this sense, I am talking here of a kind of natural autonomy, being it a self-rule with, without reference to supernatural powers only. It is a way of understanding Kant in a natural perspective, a perspective he would not allow, at least not so explicitly, 
uh, explicitly, since in his agenda there was the purpose of saving metaphysics. But the point is, that the point is, uh, I'm trying to reconcile transcendental with nature. That, and that's my idea. The transcendental grows from our relation with nature. To that end, as aforementioned, each, each of those higher faculties has a principle, a transcendental one, which, uh, which each faculty applies in order to comprehend nature, nature properly. In the sense, those transcendental principles are achieved through acting on nature, not, not exactly from nature, as in the traditional empiricists, but through our interaction with nature. And different outer nature would give us, uh, I mean, uh, would give rise to different inner transcendental principles, determining a different judgment of nature. And all the three principles are somehow connected, harmonized with each other, being the moral principle the more important. It has, as, as it was put by Kant himself in his critique of practical reason, the primacy over the theoretical one. And by, and quoting that, he says, by primacy between two or more things connected by reason, I understand the prerogative of one by virtue, virtue of which it is the prime ground of determination of the combination with the others. In some, quoting Kant again, he says, the, uh, to every faculty of the mind, gemüt, an interest, interest can be ascribed. Th that is, a principle which contains the condition under which alone its exercise is advanced. Reason, as the faculty of principles, determines the interest of all the powers of the mind, gemüt, and its own. The interest of its speculative use consists in the knowledge of objects up to the highest a priori, a priori principle, principles. Uh, that of its practical employment lies in the de determination of the will with respect to the final and perfect end. That which is needed in, in general for the possibility of any employment of reason, that is, that its principles and assertions not contradict one another is not a part of its, of its interest, but rather the condition of having any reason at all." End of quotation. So, the primacy of the practical over the theoretical or speculative is connected to the idea that the practical, practical reason, which provides a practical cognition, presents to us the final and perfect end. This kind of idea is not something just invented as, as in fiction. It is something that our mind just a perceives while reflecting about nature. Hence, the theoretical cognition is a sort of byproduct, a side effect of this pursuit of that final and perfect end of the acquisition of a practical cognition. As Kant himself says, he says, every interest is ultimately practical even that of speculative reason being only conditional and reaching perfection only in practical use." End of quotation. Since the mechanical explanation through the category of causality are insufficient to fulfill the claims of reason, it demands a new approach to nature, the tele teleological one, a paramechanical explanation, so to, so to speak. Then, then it, for example, calls it a paramechanical explanation. Uh, accordingly, reason is also regulative. There are fundamental ideas of reason, such as the ideas of God, freedom, as well as the idea of the world as wholeness, that are essential for, essential for us to apprehend nature in its totality. These ideas are conditioned sine qua non in order for us to judge nature as having an, an asymptotic progress towards a full understanding of it, of its meaning and purpose. Only through this regulative use of reason we may see some co coherence in nature. And even this regulative use is, at least as far as I understand it, embodied. I mean, at least it might be understood as embodied, 
for reasons I'm going to bring forward later on this paper. It is the result of an embodiment. At some point, it was necessary to judge nature purposely, that is, according to an idea of a purposely arranged system. The reason for this may be exemplified by using one of Kant's examples. Quoting Kant, he says, the internal form of a mere blade of grass can demonstrate its merely possible origin in accordance with the rule of ends in a way that is sufficient for our human faculty for judging, in the quotation. Nature, as it has appeared before us since the beginning, molded our faculties in order to allow us to know it. Without the very idea of a purpose, for example, many things in nature would be unknown to us. The artifacts we create are reproductions of what we observe in nature. Nature taught us how to produce artificial, artificial organisms. The same way we are now producing, for instance, AI, using our own mind as a model, in the distant past we have learned how to produce artifacts that behave just like natural organisms, in which we have observed that each part worked for the functioning of the whole. That's how the transcendental developed God got embodied inside our minds. Through, the, through our interrelation with nature, which provided us with the idea of a formative power, uh, building craft, we arrived to this very idea by apprehending nature's purposiveness. This is a regulative principle which we may use our reason in order to comprehend nature as a whole. Although it is not a constitutive, constitutive principle, as the 12 categories of the understanding are, it is yet a necessary principle. After all, how it would be possible for us to judge a natural if event such as the one that uses to exemplify the very idea of a natural end, to it a tree. In the paragraph 64 of the Critique of uh, the Judgment, he illustrates this point, firstly explaining that a simple tree generates another tree of the same genus, perpetuating itself generically. Secondly, it produces itself as an individual, having as its sustenance the raw material nature offers. And thirdly, its parts, it parts, its parts depend for its maintenance reciprocally of each other, as, as he says, one part of this creature also generates itself in such a way that the preservation of the one is reciprocally dependent of the preservation of the others. End of quotation. I believe it is a good ex example since it, it, since it po points out the way the idea of a propositiveness was imprinted on us in order to constitute the transcendental principle that allows us to judge nature as having a meaning. I mean, in a distant past, we started to observe this kind of natural event just happened before us. And that at, at that time, we certainly did not have the idea of purposelessness. But after some time, a long time, our mind was molded by the way we saw nature in a relationship that had molded also our senses, which, by their turn, determined, determined the way our minds work. In the beginning, we probably felt surprise observing such a simulacrum of purposiveness. And the more we, we, we observed that purposiveness, the stronger it became. As a matter of fact, it became innate and extraordinary complex to the point we are now able to judge nature as a coherent whole. Our faculties just work better in such a world. I mean, we are a well-adapted species since we have a well-adapted mind. And what I'm, what I'm trying to agree here is that this adaptation was the result of an embodiment. The transcendental, the more spiritual, spiritualized facet of human nature has an embodied dimension. And in the order of time, it began with some basic sensory experience, such like in Kant's tree example. 
which along our evolutionary history brought us to those increasingly faculties, like the most important, important of them, the moral one. In this sense, we certainly were not moral agents in the dawn of our history our, as we, uh, beings capable of rationality. That is, as a sort of animal that fits the idea of an animal, animal rationabilis. Which simply, it simply means we have a capacity for reason, a capacity of directing our, li our lives rationally. At some point, we became capable to wave nature according to some ends and moral ones. And all these ends sprout from the idea of moral law. This was the first rule. But the question is, but what, what kind of law can, can that be? the representation of which must determine the will, even with, without regard for the effect expected from, from it, in order for the free will to be called good absolutely and without limitation. As it is well known, the supreme principle may be stated as follows. I, uh, uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's well known. I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. This law, the moral law, is something, is something that became innate, in the sense that common human reason also agrees completely with this in its practical appraisals and always has this principle before its eyes. The innatism of this position may be identified in many parts of Kant's groundwork, such as in that passage in which he says that, we have arrived with, with, within the moral cognition of common, common human, human reason uh, at this principle, which it admittedly, admittedly does not think of so abstractly in a universal form, but, but which is, it, it actually has always before its eyes and uses as a norm for its appraisals. Here, it would be easy to show how common human, human reason with this compass in hand, knows very well how to distinguish in every case that comes up what is good and what is evil, what is in conformity with duty and or contrary to duty. If with, without uh, in the least teaching it anything new, we only, as did so Socrates, make it attentive to its own principle. End of, of quotation. Thus, we have this kind of compass as a guide in, our, in, in order for us to give nature a meaning. But the point is, again, that this compass became innate after a long time of interaction with nature itself. It is, it is part of the embodiment of the transcendental, of those elements that make possible for us to apprehend nature in a specific framework. This embodied practical law the moral law, made it possible for us to have the ideas of freedom, immortality, and God. In Kant's language, they are postulates, and the postulates of pure practical reason all proceed, proceed from the principle of morality, which is not a postulate but a law by which reason directly determines the will. Since we had the moral law before our mind's eye, it was inevitable to have also such postulates. But in Kant, we do not have a suitable unifying principle to understand such ideas. But the important point is that Kant recognized that some elements, the formal transcendental ones, were, as he said, uh, in, the, in the critique of uh, pure reason, awakened into action with experience. Kant was not aware of the mechanism through which it could have happened. He, was, he had reached important conclusions with, without knowing the mechanism that produced such order in nature. Anyway, his conclusions are not conflicting with the idea of an embodied cognition, theoretical and practical. He just did not have the key idea in order to understand such an embodiment. Anyway, in the 19th century, things have changed. After all, Charles Darwin gave us another perspective by which we may understand more properly the way we are molded 
That is the, the way we are so constituted. Kant took for granted the way we are constituted and did not ask for the net natural reasons we are so formed. It was for him something just given. But since Darwin, we have an explanation for it, a natural one, which I believe does not conflict with the transcendental. So since embodied cognition is a research program, let's assume that there is such a practical embodied cognition. That is, let's give a step further uh, although in doing that, we, are, we certainly will reach a conclusion Kant did not want to reach. After all, as I just have said, said above, Kant's intention was to save metaphysics. But the point for me here is to see on Kant's shoulders some ethical themes in another level, the level of meta-ethics and environmental ethics. That is because I want to investigate the meaning of some of our moral concepts in the context of our relation with our own environment. Given I am talking about practical cognition and nature, let's think about the role the environment plays in the development of this practical cognition. This assumption would explain the origin of our moral concepts as well as to prove the import importance of our environment and the consequent concern we must have towards it. Until the 18th century, it was very usual the leap from the teleological judgment of the world to the very idea of a creator, from the design to the designer. The natural theology was, maybe it still is, the most, for the most of people, some, something quite intuitive. It was usually connected to a physical, physical the theological proof for the exist, existence of God, a proof which Kant defines in, in his lectures on philosophical theology in the following way. He says, the uh, physical theological proof is the one in which we infer from the constitution of the present world to the nature of its author. Elsewhere in the same te text, he says, Human reason has, has need of an idea of highest, highest perfection to serve it as a standard according to which it can make determinations. Given this characterization of God, of wholeness that serves as a standard, we might, we might now ask in which sense the embodiment determined, determined the practical cognitive process that allowed us to arrive at the highest idea. To put it another way, what was, what was the formative role of the environment in the evolution of the practical cognitive processes that gave rise to this kind of idea? Well, having the fact of evolution as our background, we are now able to think the practical cognition as a dynamical system, which enables us to think the rising of moral ideas especially the higher one, the idea or metaphor of God, evolving over time in our evolutionary history. The point is that we get to this metaphorical reasoning through the physical properties of, of, our, bar, of our bodies, through their development. While using the met metaphor God, wholeness, for example, we are able to understand life and, life and its meaning that was precisely Kant's concern in 1788 when he, he wrote the essay on the use of teleological principles in philosophy in order to explain a class of forms, the organized ones, the organized ones, the organisms. The first critique had explained nature in a causal fashion through the Aristotelian idea of a causa efficiency, an efficient cause. But this kind of explanation granted our nature was not satisfactory to explain living forms. And Kant was very aware of that. Even in his Critique der Praktischen Vernunft, which was also written in 1788, we may find many passages in which he claimed the requirement of judging nature teleologically, as if, as old, it had some finality, tell us. The only way to understand life and its meaning is metaphorically speaking of an author of this world. Kant had the merit of realizing that point in spite of his metaphysical conclusions, but he was not aware of the fact 
of evolution, not of the principle of adaptiveness. So he borrowed from Blumenbach the idea of a formative force in order to explain the life forms. It was an advance, though, since it represents our ability to see the big picture, picture of nature. At some point of our nature history, it showed import, important for us to apprehend nature as a system, a dynamical one. Other creatures seem, seem to apprehend nature, if anything, inductively in a plain manner. And that was something David, David Hume and Charles Darwin both realized, namely that some creatures even the lower ones, were molded in order to see a connection between two separated events. The, this ability is probably the result of the interaction between mind and, and nature. The more complex this relation became, the more complex the mind itself became. That is, the more complex it became the way certain life forms started to apprehend nature. As a matter of fact, our faculties became, together with other creatures, more and more complex, up to the point we have now reached ideas such as the idea of God. But that's something, something we share with non-human animals. As Darwin has put it, he, say, he says, the lower animals, like man, man, manifestly feel pleasure and pain, happiness and misery. End of quotation. In sum, most of the more complex emotions and many of the more intellectual emotions and faculties are common to the higher animals and ourselves. The basic elements for our social, social institutions, like religion, for instance, are also present in lower animals. After all, as it was put by Darwin, there is no fundamental difference between men and the higher animals in their mental faculties. The evolution of morality, so I believe, was the path to the idea of God, and the road to it was a long and winding road. First, we started to make inductive inferences. Then, we started to choose among possible ends, the ones uh, that, were, that are more estimable in an evolutionary point of, point of view. At the dawn of our intentionality, when the life forms were un un unimaginable simple, we may find the first specialized cells. An in interesting description of this point is made by Daniel Dennett. He says, four and a half billion years ago, the planet Earth was formed, and it was utterly with without life. And so it, it stayed for perhaps half a billion years until the first simple life forms emerged. Then, finally, much larger, more complex cells evolved. Uh, so it continued for a few hundred million smart years in the quotation. On that account, early in, our, in, the, in their evolutionary history, organism, organisms developed the fundamental feature that allowed them to avoid harm and search for benefits. This rudimentary feature show it, showed itself essential for the development of life itself. It was the rise of a useful ability, the ability to expect some regularity in nature. In the early stage of life on Earth, the primeval life forms already postulated an order in nature in order to survive. And that order did not just happen to germinate in our minds as, as something already there, just innately ready to use. Indeed, it was necessary the coupling between mind and nature. This coupling was a successful marriage, a marriage which gave birth to a mental offspring, in which we may find countless ideas, such as the very idea of regularity. And such ideas just got stronger and stronger, especially with the evolution of a new and more recent trick, namely the, the language. As a matter of fact, nature formed the organisms in order for them to apprehend it as if there was in it a regularity. If there was a different nature, we would apprehend it differently, with different categories molded by the way we were molded by our relation with this very nature. At any rate, after some millions of millions of years, we arrived at an unifying ideal of the world, according to which nihil, nihil est sine nothing is 
without without reason. This spiritual spiritual evolution could only happen simultaneously with the physiological evolution. As we have complex thoughts, because, only because we developed our language, which required the development development of our vocal tract, of the physiological basis of our language, the same must have happened with those spiritual faculties, the faculties that made the emotions and other mental states possible. Happiness, as one of those expressions, for example, it required the development of our facial muscles, which are the physiological basis for happiness. And the happiness itself demanded language in order to be a propositional attitude. In effect, the expression of our emotions is something just inherited. But in the past, it was not like this. It became at some moment innate. And innate here only means that they, the expression of our emotions, were integrated to our biological system during, during our evolutionary history. In, in other words, they are innate because at some point they were important for us to be a well-adapted species. That's what Darwin himself called a Lamarckian view. But the point I want to emphasize here is the relation between our body formation and the formation of our intellectual faculties, especially, especially the moral one, which is something more recent in our evolutionary history. So in his notebook, N, Darwin gave us a precious insight, the idea that our language started with our ancestors imitating the sounds of nature. In this sense, the evolution of language involved an interrelation between our ancestors and nature. And this same evolu evolution, after some time, a long time, gave us language as we know it. The development of this instinct could only be possible through this mimet mimetic process. Nature, hence, molded the physiological basis of our language, our vocal tract, which became, by the way, before our mental states, before we could have such states. Uh, after all, our minds are molded by language, and language in its dawn was molded by nature. As it was put by Darwin in his The Descent of Man, I cannot doubt that language owes its orange to the imitation and modification of a various natural sounds, the voices of other animals. As the voice was used more and more, the vocal organs would have been strengthened strength, strength and perfected, perfected through the principle of the inherited effects of use. After being originated from that mimetic process of acquisition, language has itself evolved, probably out of adaptive needs especially the need for communication. There are room for many speculation here, but the point is that, the, uh, that it effectively evolved. That's a matter of fact, a truth of fact. The same ev evolution made it possible for us to, to have abstract ideas, such as those ideas that may be put under the aegis of truth, truths of reason, being God the highest one. So certainly everything in nature is complex, but we are extraordinarily complex. This extraordinary aspect is remarkable regarding our mental faculties. They differentiate us, in many cases by degree, not by kind, from the rest of nature. Our relation with nature was directly influential concerning the acquisition and development of our language, physiologically, physiologically speaking and indirectly influential regarding the development of a metaphorical reasoning, which allowed us to have the ideas we postulate on nature, such as the idea of wholeness, intimately connected to the idea of God, of designer. The issue here is about that question Dennett has put forth in his Freedom Evolves, chapter 5, to it, where does all the design come from? The evolution through the process of natural selection, give rise to the development of new levels, more complex ones, of freedom. In this sense, we have reached a broader, a broader use of inductive inferences. The very idea of induction was probably born in our mind after we have perceived 
uh, one phenomenon uh, following another one over and over again, just like in the Kant example of a tree. After some time, after, after some time, a long time, we just arrived at the idea of a sort of a secret plan of nature, as Kant put it. In other words, we started to think, another, uh, think nature through the idea of a causa finalis. And it did not take too long for us to judge nature teleologically. As it was realized by David Hume, as well as by Charles, Charles, Charles Darwin, to think inductively was an important achievement for us human animals. As a matter of fact, many living forms do that. At some level, it is essential for, for them to make inductive inferences in order to survive. It was a useful cost, custom that became innate. It was imprinted on our gamut or our mind. And uh, it also became as complex as our language. The more complex the living form, the more complex the way it judges nature. But what we have is only a sort of a simula simulacrum of regularity, which was fortified by the liveness of our past experience, in which we were able to see ev event two following event one reiteratedly. In our relation with nature, we, as many other living beings, learn how, uh, how to know it in a causal manner. Look for us, it has been usually worked. And here, we may assume that the proximity between language and causal inferences, the same way language is the result of our relation with nature, our, our world, nature plus culture, is the result of our linguistic inter interference only. The evolution of this instinct, and here we have taken for granted the effect of evolution, enabled uh, the extension of the mind of mind over nature. So the plasticity of brain was essential for this to this evolution. Evolution, as we develop our language, the sensory sensory motor experiences started to serve as basis for the formation of more complex concepts. So we, we have now the concepts of God, of purpose, and so on. Our relation with the world is a two-way road. The way we are embodied is the result of nature's pressure on us. And at the same time, the way we are embodied determines through culture the way our, or our world is. After all, the way the world partly determines our faculty, faculties determines the way the world appears to us. We see here the practical cognition as a constructive process. Since the mutual specification between an organism and its environment produces a, a specific sui generis sens sensorial motor device, this sensorial motor device is achieved through acting on nature in, in response to its pressure on us. And the same sensorial mo sensory motor device reflects the manner according to which we are molded by nature and by the world as well. If nature were different, we would be certainly different. The evolution would have required from us a different sensorial motor device. So our, our ideas referring to this world would be also different. But since we have this sensorial motor, motor device, which may be considered something contingent, I mean, since it is the result of our past needs, a different one would be logically possible. We have reached the ideas we effectively have in mind while judging nature, such as the idea of God and oldness. The same, by the way, is true about our social institutions, the ideal, ideals of liberalism, democracy, human rights, constitution, and so forth, would be comprehended as the result of our interaction with nature towards a well-adapted state. Notwithstanding the aforementioned ideas, one question remains. Mind, understood as the mute, as a set of faculties with transcendental principles of their own, is molded by our relation with nature. So we had got to the important, important idea of nature as wholeness, 
involving both nature and transcendental. The more we interact with nature, the more it gets complex. And, incredibly, the more it shows itself as intentional, purposeful. So the question is, is it, this regularity, something that lies in nature itself? Well, it was not my aim here to investigate that. My point was only to demonstrate that the embodiment is compatible with the transcendental. The problem of intentionality uh, in, 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 uh, inherent to nature itself gives, rooms, gives, gives room for another investigation. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, if you know, okay. we will have the debate afterwards, yeah? Let me <laughs> resolve this technical problem. <coughs> Uh, what you will miss is only uh, the sketch, the, the summary, and uh, a YouTube uh, movie, very simple movie about pendulum movements. Uh, only this. Uh, I will uh, talk about uh, some questions on some problems on uh, philosophy of mind, uh, especially problem of epiphenomenalism and how we can understand the mind and make some, in the final, uh, some comments uh, concerning uh, Larry Shapiro's proposal uh, in his uh, book, uh, Mind Incarnate, uh, uh, a conception he called uh, the constraint thesis. Well, uh, First, I will uh, speak something about epiphenomenalism. What does it mean? And, uh, the problem it represents. Uh, I will make some uh, relations uh, with the heart problem, uh, and uh, after I will uh, present to you uh, some special challenge that is uh, uh, represented by this bad experiment and uh, that is uh, well known and use it as an evidence uh, that mind and experiential mind or, or experience are mere epiphenomena. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, David, uh, by experience, uh, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I will try not to conflate experience with mind. Uh, my 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 conception is that an experience is uh, what we feel, what we uh, what happens when we uh, open our eyes, when we smell, when we hear. Uh, this is our experience. Uh, this is, in some sense, phenomenal if we follow Kant. Uh, the problem is that uh, possibly uh, our experience concerning uh, a certain physical description of the world, uh, possibly our experience uh, would be epiphenomenal and not properly phenomenal. Uh, well, I will read and explain some things. Uh, Thomas Huxley, the Darwinian, uh, famously said that mental events are like stem whistles that do not contribute anything to the movements of the locomotive. Here is his canonical argument. All states of consciousness in us, as in brutes, are immediately caused by molecular change in, of the brain substance. It seems to me that in man, as in brutes, there is no proof that any state of consciousness is itself the cause 
of change in the motion of the matter, the brain of the organism. If these positions are well based, say Euclid, uh, it follows that our mental conditions are simply the symbols of the state of the brain, which is the immediate cause of the act. Uh, we are conscious automata in those with free will in the unintelligible sense of that much abused term, in as much as in many respects we are able to do as we like, but nonetheless part of the great serious cause and effects which in unbroken continuity compose that which is as has uh, been uh, uh, and shall be the sum of existence. And he continued saying that as to the logical consequence of this conviction of mind, it may be permitted to remark that logical consequences are the scarecrows of fools and the beacons of wise men. The only question which any wise man can ask himself, and which any honest man will ask himself, is whether a doctrine is true or false. This is Thomas Huxley uh, in, on the hypothesis that animals are automata. Well, uh, what I will try to do uh, is to present some non-conclusive arguments that uh, the thesis is, fa is false, or uh, it likely it is that likely it's false. Well, an additional claim is that since anything that can causally contribute to a physical event must itself be a physical event. This is a common assertion uh, by physicalists. And since a mental event is something other than a physical event, to suppose that mental events could make any causal contribution of its own in the physical world would imply a violation of physical laws. If you would accept causation laws different from the physical, the nature of this causation would be scientifically problematic. Since all currently known forms of causation concern physical events, causing other physical events. Anyway, mental events are particular events, but they cannot be characterized or described as physical occurrence, the states and events described by our present physics. The sensation of yellow cannot be described as a physical occurrence without falling in the kind of categorical error that George Edward Moore called the naturalistic fallacy. He Moore's remarks on yellow, consider yellow, for example, say Moore. We may try to define it by describing its physical equivalent. We may state what kind of light vibrations must stimulate the normal eye in order that we may perceive it. But a moment's reflection is sufficient to show that those light vibrations are not themselves what we mean by yellow. They are not what we perceive. Indeed, we should never have been able to discover their existence unless we had first been struck by the patent difference of quality between the different colors. The most we can be entitled to say of those vibrations is that they are what corresponds in the space to the yellow which we actually Perceive. Uh, 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 a, no, a brief note, uh, uh, I think that Moore is wrong about the naturalistic fallacy uh, concerning ethics. But I think he's plainly right concerning these remarks on yellow and physics. And, but this is not my point here. Hence, the sensation of yellow cannot be reduced to any physically describable event even if it's true that uh, the other uh, ever accompanies the one. The view, by the way, is the same uh, of the gap pointed out by Thomas Nagel, a gap that turns impossible to derive any psychological facts from any physical ones. I, cite, I quote here Nagel in the Psychophysical Nexus, published in Consumment and Exposure in 2002. We are dealing with a gap, say Nagel, 
between the objective spatio-temporal order and the physical world and the subjective phenomenological order of experience. And here it seems clear in advance that no amount of physical information about the spatio-temporal order will entail anything of a subjective phenomenological character. Uh, okay, the same difficulty was pointed out recently by philosopher interested uh, in to understand the connection between your tasting experiences in the objective properties of what is tasted, what is tasted by us, like a wine, for example. Uh, it would be pointless, say, Cain Todd. Cain Todd will come here in the next month, uh, and we will, uh, he will talk about some things about this. Uh, we, it will be pointless, say, Cain Todd, using chemical names to describe, for example, the smells and tastes of wine, for such names do not help us capture and communicate our perceptual experience. We said this in the philosophy of wine, uh, a recent, uh, recently book. It's pointless because it's not the description we wanted. Hence, when we describe the chemicals that cause in us some olfactory, olfactory or gustatory experience, we are not describing the experience, but presumably only their cause. The same applies to Muriello. That's my uh, point concerning the interpretation of the naturalistic art. To describe the physics of the experience of yellowness is not to describe the experience of yellowness as such. Hence, it seems very plausible to many to accept that the experience of yellow, or of yellowness, if you please, uh, is an occurrence whose materiality is of a sui generis order or composition. This is, I think, what some philosophers try to mean when they label mental experience as composed not of physical matter, but of qualia. But this is queer, uh, and it's not an explanation as well, for we cannot explain something by means of an explain, unexplained pretended explanation. So I will take this label, qualia, uh, aside. Uh, if we persist in looking for a physical description of those experiential happenings, uh, we fall into the problem of committing a naturalistic fallacy. But if we try to solve the problem looking for a non-natural description, we fall into another kind of problem, uh, the so-called argument from queerness. Uh, that is, if experience were made of something entirely different from the physical matter, and here I will quote Mackey, they would be entities or qualities or relations of a very strange sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe. Back in the ethics inventing right of rock. Uh, that's my version of what Dave Chalmers has called the hard problem. Anyway, since causality is physical, remember here Huxley's view about the epiphenomenality of the mental. This seems to imply that mental events are effects without any, any physical powers. Hence, mental events would be less than the well-known and very common physical epiphenomena. The, the physical epiphenomena for shadows and stem whistles, the example of Huxley, are epiphenomenal, respectively to their cause. My shadow, for example, it's, it's another example used to explain what we mean by an epiphenomenon. My shadow on a wall does not causally affect my body. That causally impedes the illumination of the part, the part, that part of the wall surface. Similarly, the stem whistle does not certainly affect the stem engine's locomotive that causes it. But both the shadow and the stem whistle are physical events that cause other physical events in the world. The shadow reduces the temperature of the part of the wall surface, uh, and the whistle affects people's and animals' hearing systems and a lot of things. Nevertheless, if our mental experience are mere epiphenomena, it means that they do not causally affect anything physical in the world, inside or outside the brain, that we count as its source cause. It would mean that our individual experience would be locked in, in our brains, individual brains. Uh, nevertheless, mental experiences are serial, serially interconnected. Uh, the associationists and Hume and Locke all call 
the relation between one idea and other idea, one perception and other perception. So they are interconnected. Uh, hence, if uh, they are bundle of perceptions, say, for example, Hume. Hence, if mind is a merit phenomenon, those mentally, serially events should be also epiphenomenally completely locked. And their parts would be connected, perhaps by mere association, without having any causal to each other and without any causal connection between them and the brain. Uh, the causal connection we think there is between mind and world, uh, uh, as between mind and world, would be also an illusionary effect and other phenomenon. Nonetheless, this is implausible. As Tim Crane has argued persuasively, so I think, see his example, uh, Tim Crane uh, said, consider someone, let's call him Bo Lislak, uh, who wants to kill his brother. Let's suppose he's jealous of his brother and feels that his brother is frustrating his own progress in life. He could say that Bo Lislak has a reason for killing his brother. He might not think it is a very good reason or a very moral reason, but it's still a reason. A reason in the sense is just a collection of thoughts that make sense of a certain plan of action. Now, suppose that Boaz Lab is involved in a bar room brawl one night for a reason completely unconnected to his murderous plot and accidentally kills a man who, unknown to him, is his brother, perhaps his brother in, in disguise. So Boleslav has a reason to kill his brother and kill his brother, but does not kill his brother for that reason. Compare this alternative story. I'm quoting uh, Crane uh, still. Boleslav wants to kill his brother for the same reason. He goes into the bar, recognizes his brother, and shoots him dead. In this case, Boleslav has a reason for killing his brother and kill his bro kills his brother for that reason. We can agree with Crane that the difference between both cases resides in the causal connection between Boleslav's belief, belief that the man is his brother or between the Boleslav's awareness of his brother entering the bar and his behavior, a connection there is only in the second case. Uh, hence, this connection is, is what turns out those two events of killing a man in the bar room, different events indeed even though they can be externally exactly the same. Suppose, for example, uh, that the same brawl uh, has happened in the second case and that Boleslav's involvement in the brawl was actually part of his plan of killing his brother. If Boleslav's belief experience was a mere epiphenomenon, it couldn't contribute to the facts in anything. But we do not describe those facts as being the same in kind justly because their mental involved counterparts are different. They are different because the connection between Boas Lark's perception, uh, perceptions, thoughts and intentions, and the token even downwardly associated to them, that is the death of his brother, is not the same. Well, uh, let's, let's go to a second point, this experience uh, uh, and the heart problem, experience, conscious experience set up as a phenomenon in the heart problem. Uh, first, I, uh, let me quote uh, David Chalmers uh, saying the following. Uh, I'm quoting. Uh, we have good reason to believe that consciousness arises from physical systems such as brains, but we, ha we have little idea how it arises or why it exists at all. How could a physical system such as a brain also be an experiencer? Why should there be something it is like to be such a system? Present-day scientific theories hardly touch the really difficult questions about consciousness. We do not just lack a detailed theory. We are entirely in the dark about how consciousness fits into the natural order. Uh, that's Chalmers description of the predicament we are nowadays, and it's a very hard problem. Epiphenomenalism presents itself as a kind of solution to this problem, uh, but it's not a solution uh, anyway. Uh, uh, here I, uh, I quote uh, Palmer uh, in talking about this. 
but I, I will pass this. This is the epiphenomenon. Uh, no, 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 let me quote. Uh, an, an epiphenomenalist, say Palmer, would argue that mental states such as perceptions, intentions, beliefs, hopes, and desires are merely in effect or side effects of the underlying cause on neuro events, events that take place in our brains. To get a clearer idea of what this might mean, consider the following analogy. Imagine that neurons glow slightly as they fire in a brain and that this glowing is somehow aching to conscious experience. The pattern of glowing in and around the, the brain, conscious experience, is clearly caused by the firing of neurons in the brain. Nobody would question that. But the neural glow would be causally in effect, in the sense that it would not cause neurons to fire any differently than they would if they did not glow. Uh, therefore, causation runs in only one direction, from physical to mental, in an epiphenomenalist account of the mind-body problem. Although this position denies any causal effect, uh, efficacy to mental events, it is still a form of dualism because it accepts the existence of the glow of consciousness and maintains that it is qualitatively distant from, from the neural findings themselves. Uh, this is the epiphenomenal pretended solution. If a causal chain ends in some phenomenon, it means that this event is a cause of other event that initiates other but distant causal chain. But supposing that some causal chain ends uh, in an event that do not contribute causally to the appearance of any other event at all, uh, this causal chain, uh, chain ends in an epiphenomenon. Epiphenomena are physical phenomena. They are not outside the physical realm, or, 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 or at least it's not necessary to think that they are outside the physical realm. Well, mental experience can be entirely explained as epiphenomenally linked to physical phenomena occurring within some brain. A mental epiphenomenon is a kind of epiphenomenon. It is nevertheless a non-physical last or final event in a causal chain where all causal events are physical. Obviously, not all causal chains end in some epiphenomena, and not all epiphenomena are mental epiphenomena. Some epiphenomena are physical events. Nevertheless, all mental events, that's the, 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 the theory, are epiphenomenal. Being an epiphenomenal is then an essential attribute of mental events. Now we have the following heart problem. If experiential qualities are mere epiphenomena, why those epiphenomena get a form of existence at all? If we accept that we have experiences, and if we plausibly assume that animals have similar experience to uh, cockroaches, I don't know, uh, why uh, have those queer biological manifestations evolved at all? Why would uh, be equipped with those queer and usefulness and superfluous qualities. Uh, it does not make sense. Evolution would have not equipped us with so, so ubiquitous properties if they did not serve to us, that is, if they do not contribute in any way to our species or other life forms' fitness. Uh, if experience are not causally affected, why did they evolve within life Creatures. Why are animals animated? Uh, why there are not simply automata or zombies? That is, why is it that all this processing does not go in the dark without any subjective quality? Uh, I'm stopping. I'm, I'm quoting Chalmers again. Anyway, uh, consciousness exists, and if we accept Darwin's theory, it probably serves a biological function. It seems very plausible since they are undeniable facts associated with the biological development and the natural evolution of the nervous system. An evidence of this is the ubiquitous fact that mental experience occur within living organisms equipped with evolved brains. And since human experience are very sophisticated compared with non-human animal experience, it seems also that our more complex mental experience are continuous uh, continuous with our more complex brains. So it's very plausible that brain evolution and mental experience differentiation run parallel. 
Nonetheless, it is argued that the human brain is indeed large and complex by natural selective pressures, even though consciousness is plausibly not an adaptive device, but an acceptation. Acceptation. That is the view explored by Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould uh, uh, tried to uh, uh, present an argument that uh, most of our uh, thoughts about morality and conscious experience, uh, uh, like Dennis, for example, for example, uh, uh, are misguided because they they are not necessarily adaptations. Uh, uh, they can be other things that uh, his concept is an acceptation. Uh, I will pass this because I don't think this. Uh, uh, is important to my point here. Uh, so, uh, nevertheless, why should we accept that mental experience like consciousness are mere phenomena? For even if it's plausible or likely, it does not mean that it's probable, probable, probable or true. Uh, we should have evidence in favor of this explanation. But what evidence do we have in favor of the hypothesis that mental experience are mere phenomena? Would the evidence that uh, be that all mental experiences are contained by some brain even reliably identified by some equipment, also an acceptable evidence that mental events we have uh, are, uh, are epiphenomenally caused. We can understand mental phenomena or epiphenomena as events within a brain or events within an embodied brain, but it does not affect also the, 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 the heart problem. Uh, uh, because mental, uh, for example, mental phenomena are based on neural events within a brain, provided that brain has been and is now interacting with its body. Related to the brain, I believe, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's Shakir's, I don't remember because I, it, it's missing in my, in my uh, paper, but <laughs> related to the brain, I believe that the body proper provides the reference content. In a curious way, pleasure and pain, whether they start in the skin or in a mental image, happen in the flesh. But I don't remember exactly. I don't know. Yeah. Huh? That's the ah, it's the Marcio. Yes, it's the Marcio. <laughs> so, excuse me. But that is the problem. Mental experience happen in the flesh, but they cannot be described as such as flesh. And even if they are flesh phenomena, in some sense, they are not flashy things. But what is an epiphenomenon? Uh, the part I will present, uh, uh, I plan to present to you, uh, was an image of uh, pendulums, movements, and creating in us uh, a kind of vision that pendulum are pendula are dancing, uh, and uh, that's uh, one of the uh, example examples uh, cited uh, uh, to exemplify what is an epiphenomena, something that uh, occurs uh, outside and uh, has some effect in us inside. Uh, and uh, what uh, the effect in our mind uh, is only uh, the visual effect we see is only an epiphenomenon because it's not really independent. Well, uh, what do we know about uh, that mental uh, experience are alike in kind with the observed phenomenon of pendulums dance, that's the point. For we are observing the pendulums dancing, but we do not observe our mental experience, we simply experience them. Thomas Nagel famously remarked that even if we sustain that there is some necessary connection between the brain and our experience, we have difficulties to prove it, since it could not be established by discovering the underlying physical cause of the appearance of conscious experience, say, say Nagel, on analysis with an underlying physical cause of the appearance of heat, since in the case of experience, the appearance of the thing itself and not, uh, uh, is the, uh, the appearance is the thing itself and not merely its effect on us. Well, the same can plausibly be said of the alleged analogy between the paradigmatic physical epiphenomena and the allegedly epiphenomenal connection between our brains and our experience. Our observation of the pendulum's dance is, of course, a mental experience, but the experience of observing the pendulum's dance 
is not an observation of this experience. Unless we are capable of having some kind of meta experience, our experience are not empirical evidence that can count in favor of the belief that we are having experience. When we go through an experience, we do not simply believe that we are going through it, we simply know that. But when we observe the pendulum's dancing, if we know other things as well, for example, that pendular movements are always longitudinal, swinging back and forth due to gravity, we don't need to know all the mathematical details of pendulum's physics, but uh, we can know these same things. So we can conclude that the wave and the dance appearance is only an optical illusionary effect. This illusion, we conclude, is a mental phenomenon caused by a group of regular pendular movements watched at some point. In this case, we have evidence that the observed wave movements are mere phenomenal effects, that is, they are only events in our minds caused by the pendulum's trajectories, and the circumstance of our observational point of view, and that those observed events do not contribute as such to the physical movements of the pendulums that are actually their real and primary cause. Consider now the view that our experience are alike to pendulum's dance, that they are also epiphenomenal. We have evidences in favor of the belief that the pendulum's dance is an epiphenomenal, I said it. Uh, but which evidence do we have uh, besides the analogy that the mind experience are epiphenomenal? For we should have evidences in favor of the hypothesis that the mind does not affect the brain in the same way that the brain affects the mind. Do we have evidence that the observed wave movements are caused by the pendulum physics and that they do not contribute anything to it? Well, I think well, experiment can offer what we need. Uh, we can simply observe the pendular movements at different perspectives and see that those new observations are incompatible with the hypothesis that the pendulum's dance is objectively occurring. So it's easy to conclude that the dance is only a visual subjective effect, and this is what makes it a phenomenon. For it's an event that occurs only inside the observer's mind with any causal interference with the physical movements of those objects that cause it. Could we find evidences that mental experiences are only brain a phenomena? How can we prove then that our experiences are simply a phenomena? Let's suppose that we can. And suppose also that we do have uh, some evidence that our experiences are a phenomena. Uh, I will see it uh, left, uh, next uh, if we can present some evidence about it. But let's assume this. Uh, the point now is that some of our experiences are something we really do care about. Some of them, for example, painful experiences are important to us by their negative experiential quality. Others are important because they are good experiences. Consider the view that our actions are physically caused, for they obviously are, but that our experience cannot causally contribute to them. How can we explain now the value we attach using it to pleasures and pains, for example. It's very plausible that human beings relish their own experience. Uh, by, the, but, uh, uh, by the way, it's plausible also that only rational beings like us can relish taste and smells since only they can take an interest in the experience itself rather than in the information conveyed by it. I, cited, I quoted Roger Scruton in The Philosophy of Wine. Uh, about the problem of tasting. Uh, well, yeah, if experience are at phenomena, how could we have an interest in the experience itself? Take an interest in some experience implies that what moves us to the relishing state is the experience in not another thing, some brain state, for example. If we accept that the object of relishing is the experience, accepting also that both mental states the relishing and the experiencing are at phenomena. We should accept also that some rounded cerebral phenomenon is occurring independently of the link between, for example, the allegedly a phenomenon of tasting something and the uh, at phenomenon, of, a phenomenon of relishing. We would be, in this case, not very different from a zombie that could be in the same grounding cerebral state without experiencing the phenomenon of tasting and relishing in it. A zombie also uh, can also drink wine and taste wine. Well, uh, suppose philosophically zombies, of course, and philosophically tasting, of course. Suppose that a zombie is sipping a very good wine. 
Should we say in this case that the zombie is interested in what he's doing? I don't think so, for we cannot say about him that he is moved by the pleasure he's feeling. Uh, but if our pleasures are epiphenomena, we should say uh, exactly, exactly the same about us. That's the consequence. The view that smells and sounds are independent objects, uh, uh, here I'm using the, a concept of Roger Scruton that I think is very interesting. Uh, uh, that is that uh, smells and sounds are secondary objects, differently from the objects of sight that uh, have some primary, primarily ontologically uh, sense. Uh, well, that view that smell and sounds are independent objects helps to explain the fact that we can be interact, interested in them and not interested in the primary objects that cause them. Uh, this explains how we love music, not the musical instruments. Consider other example, the case of games and the experience of their spectators. The fans' exhilaration uh, is a mental experience caused by the game. The game lives in the exciting, excitement of the fan, uh, Scruton said that. Of course, the game lives in a lot of experience of fans and players. A fan then is excited at the game as well as by the game. Uh, if the existence of the game depends on the fans' excitement, then the importance of the game depends at least in part on mental experience. For if our experience as fans were only a phenomenon, the belief that we can be excited at the game as well as by it would be indefensible. For the truth would be that we are only excited by the game. Uh, Scruton's views that the excitement can be an excitement at would be only an illusion of sense. Uh, nevertheless, it's true, uh, uh, because it is a fact of the experience in itself, or the aesthetic is a fact of the experience in itself. Uh, see other situation, the situation described by Kendall Walton uh, of two different people seeing a same mountain. Uh, the mountain is uh, the Mount Monadnock that I've never seen. But uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Everson plausibly have seen, and so uh, his example I, I think has uh, relations to uh, the life of Emerson, I suppose. But uh, well, in some sense, see the, the situation: uh, two people uh, seeing a mountain, the Mount, uh, the, the Monadnock Mountain. Uh, well, in some sense, yes. Uh, would they watching the same scene? Yes, in some sense, they they are. For the pattern of light waves entering the eyes of the farm boy and the tourists are exactly the same. Hence, both see the same object in the distilled sense, but because each has a different perceptual disposition, say Walton. But the boy sees what the boy sees is that the mountain is Mount Monadnock. But the tourist sees that it is a mountain shaped like wave with a cabin near the top. Uh, this is the figure of the mountain. You can see it is in the internet. Uh, that is, the difference between those two perceivers is perceptual. They see different things. To say that they see the same thing but form different ideas or representation means that each of those two different ideas was produced in a different mind by some inferential process. No, nevertheless, their perceptions are very different, following Walton. What they see is not the same scene. One of them sees the Mount Monadnock and the, all, the other only a mountain of some shape and a cabin near its top. If Walton is right, both have different experience. To the experience of seeing the Mount Monadnock is quali uh, qualitatively different from the experience of seeing merely some peculiar mountain. But the difference can be explained only by difference in their brains, for the light waves reflected in, on their eyes is roughly the same. The experience can anyway be mere phenomena, but if they were only a phenomenon, it means that their occurrence do not make any difference at all to the individuals that happen to have those experiences. But the main difference between both is that one of them is actually seeing the Mount Monadnock, 
And this unique experience is eventually what can be of matter to him, if it matters something at all for him. Suppose one of them, this guy is Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, for example, and it matters to him just because it reveals the Mount Rodenbach. Well, uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the worst difficulty is to, uh, uh, to make some uh, objections to the famous an infamous Libet's experiment. Uh, this is uh, uh, a problem I don't think I have a complete uh, uh, answer, but uh, let's see. Uh, Benjamin Libet, uh, a neuroscientist, uh, uh, recruited subjects uh, and asked them to spontaneously flex their wrist uh, whenever they felt like it while their brain waves were recorded with a simple EG instrument. Uh, participants looked at a screen where a bright light moved along a circular trajectory, like the pointer on a clock, uh, as an aid for them to note when they first became aware that they wanted to move their wrist. The light was at the one o'clock position when I decided to move my hand. They uh, timed. Uh, to confirm how well subjects could judge time, they had to indicate, to indicate where the light was. Uh, well, people, uh, I have a problem with my... Okay. Uh, uh, to indicate where the light was when they started to actually fix their hand. Uh, this time can be accurately or objectively established by measuring muscular activity with another electrode. The volunteers were indeed quite accurate in their judgments of onset of muscular motion. So it is likely that they were equally accurate in judging onset of the conscious decision to move the hand. Uh, what became apparent was that the beginning uh, of the readiness potential preceded the conscious decision to move by uh, 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 seconds. That is, the brain acted before the conscious mind did. Uh, this is a complete reversal of the deeply held intuition of mental causation. I'm, I'm quoting uh, Koch uh, in another book uh, uh, compiled by Murphy et al. Uh, and so it's not my words. Uh, uh, that is, this is why this experience was and remains controversial. But it has been refined in a number of ways over the intervening years, and its basic conclusion stands. Uh, so recently, a uh, MRI variant uh, of such an experience was carried out in which subjects had to move either their left or their right hand. Hemodynamic activity in parietal and prefrontal cortex predicted which hand would be used up to eight seconds prior to the actual onset of movement. Uh, the brain starts to act before the conscious mind decides. Somewhere in the brain's catacombs, possibly in the basal ganglia, a decision to move is made, say, because some threshold has been spontaneously exceeded. Uh, well, uh, one thing Libet's experiment has proven is that the experience of decision-making or the consciousness of the decision of making a body movement is accompanied by physical actions or events in the brain, and that there are some of them that precede the experience of the decision itself. Uh, uh, do you understood the, the, the experiment, the Lib Libet experiment? Uh, uh, but the, uh, the point is that uh, uh, he uh, presented an experience that, that uh, uh, do not prove, but that uh, presented uh, the fact that when people say I'm having an experience, I, an experience, something related to it, to, it, to, to this experience was uh, ever uh, uh, marked in the electroencephalographic uh, uh, registration. Uh, so uh, something occurred in the brain before the conscious mind or the experience was reported, or the person 
uh, my point is uh, accepting that Libet's experiment was well done, uh, that it's not uh, before the report of the experience, but of the experience itself. Uh, would those findings be evidence that consciousness is a mere phenomenon? Well, Lisbeth actually thinks that. And a large group of other researchers agree with him. But which is Lisbeth's finding indeed? Here is my interpretation of his findings. Lisbeth's experiments, he can group, we can group all, here all experimental findings compatible with Lisbeth's, Lisbeth's original experiment, show a very tiny time discrepancy between an EEG or, a, or a MFRI, MRI, uh, functional MRI, evidence uh, for the beginning of one, one's mind's voluntary decision within the subject's brain and the conscious reported beginning of the same decision by the same subject. Let's call the readiness potential signaled in the EEG subject a P evidence, a physical evidence, or better, an electro-neurophysiologic evidence that there is activation of uh, a group of neurons in a subject brain uh, tissue, and T, uh, at T, and a time T, and the subject's report of his consciousness of his own decision and M evidence that the decision was made by the subject at T line. What Lisbeth found was that there is a tiny discrepancy between T and T line, and since T precedes T line in significantly 0.3 and or to 0.5 seconds, that this discrepancy is an evidence that consciousness is not the cause of the final body movements. Uh, the cause of body movements is entirely in the biophysical occurrence show it in the EEG. Well, we don't have reasons to doubt Lisbeth's findings so we can accept those findings as observational evidence. Nevertheless, the observational evidence is that there is a brain activity associated with the subject's decision prior to his unconscious report of the decision. Would that mean that consciousness is a mere phenomenon? Not necessarily. But we can present other plausible explanations for those empirical observations. One of them is that subject's decision involves a complex union of brain electrophysiological activity and mental experience, including consciousness. The fact that there is a brain activity before consciousness does not imply that mental experience do not contribute causally to any voluntary movements, for muscle movements also occurs after the mental events. We would have indirect evidence against the causal powers of the mental if we could find brain activity causally associated with voluntary or intentional action in absence of any conscious experience of one's decision. This would be a good proof, uh, but this is another kind of experiment. Uh, and I don't know uh, if uh, those kind, uh, if this kind of experiment uh, exists at all. This possible observation would mean that the contingent cons conscious will plausibly does not contribute causally with the action of the age, or with the agent is conscious, for the same action uh, could be done by the same agent voluntarily but unconsciously. Is that the point of the uh, Lisbon? Nevertheless, it remains the possibility that the agent can voluntarily act consciously and unconsciously, but it does not imply that when he acts consciously, that conscious experience does not contribute anything to his deed. Besides that, it also does not imply that mental conscious experience does not have any causal effects, since mental experience could contribute to neural activations related to other chain of decisions as well. Uh, well, uh, that's uh, my, uh, what I tried to say about Lisbeth uh, uh, experiment. Uh, uh, what would be my uh, uh, alternative uh, interpretation and explanation for the relation uh, of mental uh, experience and brain uh, neuroactivity? Well, uh, my point is, why does not think instead in mental and neurological events and states as physical necessary sides of a uh, same coin? In this case, a mental experience of some type would be a site uh, 
a side, like a side of a coin of some particular brain tokenism. Uh, the other side would, would be that we could describe as a purely neurophysical occurrence. Mental experience in this case would be viewed as a side of a complex and complete brain occurrence. The other side would be the neurological event, physically or physiochemically described. But in this case, we would have a unique brain event, implausibly the same applies to brain process and brain states. A whole individual physical or perhaps, uh, oh God. Uh, or perhaps this is the problem when I when we don't page uh, <laughs> our material. <laughs> I don't find the rest of my paper. <laughs> I think this is it, 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 it's here. Well, uh, but in this case we would have an unique brain event, a whole individual physical uh, uh, event. Uh, or perhaps something, no. but I will pass this. Uh, I don't find, you do you have, what's the first word? <laughs> what was the last sentence you read? Perhaps and then? Let me see your, uh, God. I, will, I will try to finish, uh, but excuse me for this. Yeah. Uh, I, I will try to present you the final. Uh, why does not think in this? And so uh, this is. Uh, why does not think instead in mental and neurological events and states as physical necessary sides of the same coin? In this case, a mental experience of some type would be a side of some particular brain token even. The other side would be what we would describe as a purely neurophysical occurrence. Mental experience in this case would be viewed as a side of a complex and complete brain occurrence. The other side would be the neurological event, physically or physiochemically described. But in this case, we would have a unique brain event. Uh, nevertheless, uh, since we still don't have appropriate concepts to grasp and linguistically express this kind of natural event, we couldn't describe it, with, it without committing some fallacies the naturalistic or better the physiologic fallacy and the mentalistic fallacy. That is the fallacy of trying to mistakenly describe one side of a coin, employing concepts we use to describe the other. Those fallacies possibly would be consequences of our natural and bodily constrained epistemic faculties. Uh, and this is, I think, compatible uh, with what Thomas Nagel glimpsed, saying that mental states could have a dual sense. Uh, I quote Nagel, uh, past. The proposal is that mental states would have a dual sense, phenomenological and physiological, but we still don't understand how this could be, since our modal intuitions go against it. In particular, we, will, we still have to deal with the apparent consensibility of an exact chemical, physiological, functional replica of a conscious human being that nevertheless has no subjective phenomenological interior at all, a zombie in current jargon. This is an illusion, according to the proposal, but it still has to be dissolved. The task of defending a necessary connection between the physical and the phenomenological requires some account of how a connection that is, in fact, internal remains stubbornly, stubbornly external from the point of view of our understanding. Nagel is remarking that our understanding is systematically driving to the error of affirming an external connection but we cannot present any external description of this internal connection without committing a naturalistic fallacy. This is my word. Uh, since the external is external, precisely because it's not an experience as such. External and internal are basic corporeal semantic tools without 
then we couldn't grasp anything in itself, uh, in the Kantian sense, not necessarily because uh, uh, we can grasp, I think, can't say that we cannot. Uh, that is outside the realm of our experience. Internal and external are metaphorical basic concepts. It's easy to see a necessary connection between external things as well as it's easy to see necessary natural connections between internal events or states. But it's tricky to apply those same modal notions of necessity and possibility when we try to describe the natural connection between mind and world. For when we try to do that, the internal becomes missing, and we cannot obvious, obviously show any internal or phenomenological description of the physiology of our brain activity. So the necessary connection between them is unavoidably impossible to describe and to grasp with our modal notions of necessity and possibility, for the description of our experience and the descriptions of what are not an experience at all, uh, is no object, uh, uh, in itself, uh, are only conveyed by bodily notions like inside and outside, external and internal. This impossibility does not obviously imply that there is a non-contingent relation between the mental and the physical brain. Uh, this is uh, another problem, uh, so I will pass it. Uh, final. Uh, Nagel Point is in some sense skeptical about the possibility of constructing a theoretical concept able to correctly describe and represent brain events in its integrity. Perhaps the embodied view presented by Damasio, for example, could illustrate a way of attaining this apparently impossible way. Damasio's view is that, I quote, mental phenomena are not reducible to brain circuits or nerve cells, let alone to molecules, because they are not any of those things in an isolation. And they are not just the mere collection of all those things together. Mental phenomena are biological states that occur when many brain circuits, circuits operate together according to particular designs. The plausible identity is not between mind and brain or between mind and neurons or circuits or molecules. molecules. The plausible identity is between mind and complex biological states. Well, but this plausible identity between mind and complex biological states is only plausible if, if those complex biological states were not simply, simply reducible to those physical states described nowadays by means of our present physical and neurophysiological concepts. What we need hence is not a plausible identity between mind and biology, but a new and more complex description where neurons, life, and brain functioning are described as complex minded things. I really don't know if it's possible to construct this kind of description, for, for as we've seen, it's possible that our descriptive capacities depend on uh, our own mental abilities and bodily mental functions. In this case, we should simply accept this as an epistemic impossibility and try to walk on this path would lend us inevitably to the fallacies I've mentioned above Similar, by the way, with the paralogisms Kant has detected, for example, in Kant in, uh, in this work. And definitely of this, the fact is that we can form an idea of a necessary psychophysical nexus. And if we could offer some evidences in favor of this possibility, we could walk away and shrug to the alleged poss impossibility of conceptualizing and presenting unproblematic descriptions of this nexus. The alleged evidence is in favor of epic phenomenalism presents the big problem, that is that mental experience occurs invariably after certain brain occurrence and hence that mental experience do not contribute causally to any bodily external movements of, of anyone, human or animal. But the likelihood of this explanation would be very high if we could find, for example, a person with full and healthy neuronal, uh, neuronal activity that do not present mental experience. Uh, could we find an individual with, brain, with a brain like us, or a human being, uh, without mental experience, but that can make the same voluntary body movements that individuals like us can make, supposing that it's physically impossible to arrange this situation? The consequences that mental and bodily occurrence are likely inseparable components of one and unique biological event. Uh, people could think, nonetheless, that some neurological signs and symptoms, uh, like tics, dyspraxias, 
and the choreic and the spasmodic bodily movements, the rare akinetic mutism, uh, and some psychiatric disorders like the alien limb syndrome uh, could present plausible objections to this conclusion. Nevertheless, patients and their physicians uh, usually see those situations as involuntary, involuntary. Patients actually do not experience them as voluntary movements. Actually, they are not bodily movements of the same type of the bodily movements that interest us here. Those in which our experience take a part as causally relevant. Uh, so, uh, the final remark is that uh, I, I made, <laughs> uh, concerning Shapiro's work, I made a, 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 a brief uh, remembering of Saul Critic in Naming and Necessity, uh, pointing out uh, to the uh, conceptual and uh, possibility of uh, separating mind and uh, and brain, and uh, some points of Thomas Nagel, uh, but I think this uh, is one of uh, the, uh, if I can call, discoveries of Larry that uh, it's not, it, it, it's not uh, uh, we don't uh, need to respond them. Uh, for uh, I think here Larry Shapiro has solved the problem. Uh, Shapiro's constraint thesis is, or so I think, the view that even if it is logically conce conceivable that brain states can exist without any accompanying consciousness, it is physically or naturally likelihood that a brain state biologically asso associated with some mental experience could exert their natural, or uh, use here uh, Ruth Millikan concept of proper function, uh, was, then uh, their proper function without producing those very same mental occurrences. A brain state that eventually does not produce the experience it produces in a normal in normal human beings or animals uh, is a dysfunctional state, and hence it's not the same state when it contingently does not produce its mental counterpart. It is a disease of the state. I think uh, my coined view of mental experience and neurophysiology is plainly compatible with Shapiro's constraint thesis. Uh, uh, we can uh, think about if it is compatible with the multiple realizability thesis, but I don't think so. For multiple realizability thesis, can it constitute a plausible explanation for the fact that beings with neurological systems can have mental experience? For those events, would be an explainant and rather mysterious occurrence, at least without assuming some queer dualistic ontology. So that's uh, uh, what I could present to you. And excuse me for my <laughs> confusing uh, way to present it and the, 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 my loss uh, uh, of the page. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, and we will have now a break. We have coffee and outside and some juice, okay, and snacks. So, uh, so we will continue now with the debate and with questions to Marco and Carlos. And before we start again, I wanted to announce that we decided the rest of today, so we will go to a churrascaria, and the name is Na Brasa in Porto Alegre, and uh, the street, I can give more information if someone wants more, but the street is Nilo Pesanha, and um, so it, someone is, Deborah is organizing a car to um, to take some of the participants to Porto Alegre and back to San Leopoldo. So if one has doubts and wants more information, please speak with me or with Deborah, okay? So let's continue.
Yeah. I have a question for Marco. I, I think I, I agree with what you said about epiphenomenalism, and in, in particular, Libet's experiment doesn't seem to show that the decision doesn't play some sort of causal role in, in the behavior. Uh, but there's another troubling aspect about Libet's research that I just wanted to ask you about. It, I usually understand his experiments as calling into question free will. So you have the brain activity at time t, the decision at time t plus 1, and then the wrist movement at time t plus 2, let's say. Now suppose that the, the, the duration of the gap between t and t1 was five minutes or an hour. And so the experimenter can say an hour before the subject has made the decision at time t2 that the subject will be making the decision at 12.14 p.m. or something like that. Uh, so that seems to challenge not the causal efficacy of the decision, that's still a link in the causal chain between the brain activity and the behavior, but it does seem to challenge the idea that the subject's the subject is, it's the subject's decision that's actually, um, that it's actually the subject's decision, right? Because the experimenter knows even before the subject does that uh, he'll be moving his wrist at 12, 14 p.m. or something. I, I just wanted to know whether you agree that that's damaging to an account of free will. Uh, you were right that uh, the target of the Lisbeth, uh, uh, the Lisbeth experiment uh, has uh, as its main ob objective to confront the thesis that free will uh, exists. That there is uh, uh, a real will uh, that cause or a free will or the will, the will, the decision. Nah? Uh, uh, is the cause, the real cause of our actions or or not? Uh, that the, uh, the point is that uh, if uh, the consciousness uh, will, now the conscious will, can have some, have some Part or in the in the in the, in, in our actions, uh, but uh, my, uh, I, I understand your point. I'm reflecting about this uh, kind of uh, remark that uh, the point of the experiment is about free will and not uh, about our experience uh, at large. Uh, 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 well, I interpreted it uh, since uh, the conclusion is that the, the, uh, our, our conscious will is an epiphenomenal. Uh, my interpretation is, uh, well, all of our conscious experience in this case should be uh, like this uh, illusionary uh, effect and so uh, the, 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 the challenge of the of Lisbeth experiment is not only uh, not concerns not only free will but all of our uh, experience uh, or uh, mental occurrence. No? I, I think uh, uh, Thomas Nagel interpret this way the problem of phenomenalism and. And uh, even if a lot of people uh, uh, take free will as the main problem, I don't think free will is uh, the main problem. Uh, 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 because free will is a, a, a tricky concept. Uh, 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 no. uh, uh, in some sense, we can accept, I think, that our will <laughs> is not free no? and don't accept uh, and we don't accept that uh, our experience are epiphenomena uh, uh, and ac accept uh, in 
consequences that our experience are important and it, uh, uh, we care about them and so they uh, can and if we care about them if they are important to us in some sense they necessarily have some causal uh, uh, contribution or participation or causal effect and but you were right that uh, Lisbeth's experiment is on free will. But the point is of the time, uh, the, the, the problem of time is not that, you, you were right, that yeah, T1 and T2 or uh, T0 or T1 uh, can be one second, milliseconds, and no, it's not a problem. But I interpreted this uh, finding Let's suppose that it's a finding because we are assuming that the experiment is a good, uh, uh, um, well-made, well-designed experiment, and I'm not sure because I didn't see it. Uh, uh, in medicine, I, we, we usually see the, 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 the experiment, and we don't, we don't see it. I don't see this experiment. But uh, assuming that it's good and it's well-designed, uh, uh, the point is, if there is two events in different times, uh, milliseconds, seconds, or uh, we have uh, uh, an antecedent event and a uh, uh, posterior event, and so uh, accepting the classical or canonical view on causality, that causality is between events, and this is problematic. Because we can uh, uh, discuss, discuss that, uh, pro uh, uh, that uh, why not causality is something that uh, occurs uh, between states, not only between events. But uh, I, uh, I, uh, I have taken this apart. It is a very difficult issue. But uh, assuming that it, that causality is between events, so. Uh, the canonical view is that, uh, like Hume said, uh, we say that the cause is the event that uh, occurs before. And so, uh, 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 since we know that brain cause uh, actions, and we don't discuss this, uh, of course, brain activity uh, contributes or uh, causally uh, uh, make us uh, uh, make us to move our arms, and so uh, uh, the point is: if the phenomenon or epiphenomenon or the mental experience uh, contributes in some sense to the uh, to our action, and uh, well, since the uh, it's plausible also that uh, our experiences are caused by brain activity and I think it's, it's plausible you know? uh, uh, and if, it, if the event is anterior the point is if the representation of epiphenomenalism that the anterior the brain uh, anterior event that cause the mental is uh, the soul or the unique uh, event that cause my arm or my wrist uh, movement, and th th that's the point. Uh, I don't know if I uh, 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 answer uh, your question, but uh, uh, I try to uh, use Lisbeth's uh, experiment because they it's used as the most important uh, experiment uh, and try to see if uh, if it's real it, it, it is really uh, an evidence against the causal uh, efficacy of our mental uh, experience experience another problem is the relation between uh, the connection between mental experience and brain uh, uh, function
function or brain activity because uh, it's a different issue. But uh, for uh, my suggestion that we can understand uh, uh, brain activity and ex mental experience as uh, something like two sides of a, 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 one, a coin. Uh, what I, I'm trying to 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 to, uh, to metaphorically, I don't know, but. Uh, present is uh, we need a, a conception of a physical occurrence uh, like the presence of a coin uh, that have two sides like something like this and uh, and we have uh, nowadays only uh, a physical description of one side of it. And the other side is not something that we can describe, but only what we can feel because it's, it occurs in us. But I don't know if it's really uh, a good <laughs> a representation of the, pro, uh, uh, of the idea. Uh, my point is that uh, we can accept uh, Lisbeth's findings. Uh, uh, and accepting that uh, even if there is some temporal uh, discrepancies between what occurs in the brain and what occurs in our in, in our minds, uh, we can accept that this pair of uh, events occurs in brain when they are effective. Uh, or uh, 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 binded. Uh, th th this is the, and this is what we need. And I don't think we need uh, more than this. Uh, we can probably we cannot describe physically the complex of these two uh, events without uh, creating two kind of uh, disciplinary. Uh, descriptions, physics and psychology. Uh, so probably we are uh, uh, captured by this necessity, epistemic necessity. But uh, but uh, but the point is, uh, if we have, if we could have an evidence that there could be a brain event without a mental experience that. Uh, cause a voluntary action. So we have, in this case, an evidence or a, a good evidence that mental experience are mere epiphenomena. So because in this case, they really don't participate in a coined or a um, uh, complex union uh, uh, effectively, effectively causing uh, uh, in the, uh, or actions. That's the, the view. Uh, so, <clears throat> Larry was uh, asking about, about decision about free will and so on. Uh, I think both of you spoke about uh, decisions, practical decisions, and um, I will start uh, with a question to Carlos, and and then maybe you both can link uh, what I say to what you present. So you said at the beginning of your talk, you said that you would be banished from the Kantian society. <laughs> So that's my uh, that's my cue to to speak a little bit about it. Um, it it's really uh, strange to see people uh, trying to naturalize Kant, but it's happening. So you you are not alone in that. So Robert Hanna is doing that in, in at, at some degree and others. Uh, 
but there remain many questions about it. Some are very, um, I say, very intrinsic questions about how to interpret it, uh, Kant's work. So, but you tried to to see Kant in a, I think, in from a broader perspective, so that you can see Kant as not doubting some very common sense truths about us humans. So, and you tried to uh, quote it Kant in when he speaks about humans in a very common sense, as I understood it, okay? Uh, so, and at the same time, uh, so you tried to link the Darwinian perspective, who is for us very familiar right now with this transcendental perspective, with Kant transcendental perspective. Uh, the first question would be, is that really not a, a mortal sin what you did, like you implied at the beginning of your talk? Is that not a mortal sin? Or, uh, or sorry, is that not really uh, killing Kant in the sense that it's not anymore Kant as we know him, if you link Darwin and Kant. And um, the second question would be about, then about more link to free will. Uh, you spoke about evolution and how evolution would Led, uh, would uh, bring us to this uh, practical connection and to our, our practical capacities and also to our theoretical capacities. And um, I would ask you if you think that all these concepts, all these notions, uh, including about God, are just useful notions. So would you agree about that, that they are just useful devices? Or are there more in these notions? Is there more in these notions? Um, so would you still say that there is something that we can call freedom, that it's not just like Hume says, it's just a way to speak about what we do, but it's not really, a re it doesn't make reference to something, uh, to some entity or some event or some, um, so unique, unique capacity we have, it wouldn't be a unique capacity. It would be just something that is, that happens uh, in the chain, causal chain. So, yeah, so would you agree with what's what spoken yesterday, that we don't need a strong notion of freedom from what you said today. So in that is a, maybe okay. Marco could also say something about that. Thank you for your question. So uh, I have more questions than answers here about what I'm writing in this paper. As a matter of fact, it is the first paper in which I try to connect Kant with some other tradition. My my uh, work is is more exegetical in Kant than uh, interpretative. But this time, since I'm reading a lot of things in uh, philosophy of mind, I tried to uh, uh, first I tried to write a paper in this 
new tradition only. Then, while I was reading this text, I I uh, start to re remember uh, some parts of Kant's uh, philosophy, and then I I have this kind of insight that I it would be interesting to try to connect it, Kant with some of these conceptions. Uh, and the key uh, concept of Kant that I took uh, was especially his concept of mind, his idea of a gemut, uh, because this idea of mind, I think it's broader than most of the, most of the philosophers uh, are used to, uh, to, uh, uh, to take it far. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, usually, I, I see that the, the philosophers try to use mind as a cognitive and in the, the speculative sense, and not in the, this broader sense, and uh, that includes the practical sense. So, uh, I think I'm, I'm trying to uh, interpret Kant here in an external perspective, so it's not uh, answer your the first, the, part, the first part of your first question. Uh, it's not an a internal approach, but an external one. And I, I don't think uh, that we kill Kant in doing that, because uh, uh, it's a kind of uh, – uh, it, it's, a, a, uh, it's a way to bring Kant to the contemporary discussion and to show that some of his ideas just make sense, even if you are working in a field such as, such as the philosophy of mind. So in this sense, it's, it's of course, the, the, uh, the modern Kant, I think, uh, he died if you do that. I mean, he died if you, if, if you try to uh, do this kind of uh, Interpretation of his his thought, but I don't think I don't think I don't think you, uh, he must stay there in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the eighth, eighth, 18th century. I think you can bring he bring him to the uh, to, to, uh, to to the contempor uh, the contemporary philosophy. So that's why I don't think we kill him. I think it's something uh, more uh, like to bring him to a discussion here, using him, uh, him as a background. Because I know it, 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 uh, uh, along the text, along the paper, I tried to, uh, to explain, explain that uh, I'm, I was doing uh, a step further. I mean, I, 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 uh, he couldn't go so far because he didn't have the concepts such as the evolution, adaptiveness, so that's why I used that met metaphor uh, and, and tried to show that I was thinking on his shoulders. So maybe, maybe that's interesting because I think that uh, this analogy is interesting because Kant didn't, uh, couldn't see that, but on his shoulders we, were, we are able to see that. <laughs> that's, that's the idea of my analogy, but so, uh, that's that's why I, I use it here because of course Kant couldn't go any further than he effect effectively did, but we can do that and try to think that uh, even uh, uh, facing problems that the philosophy of mind just uh, bring to us, we can uh, have Kant as a background. And then, so that's why there is this need, I think, to reread Kant and uh, uh, from another point of view. Uh, uh, but of course, strictly Kantian will probably say that it's not Kant, and it's not, of course, it's not Kant. But uh, it's, uh, it's not, I think it's not uh, an exegetical study here. It's, uh, it's a way to interpret Kant in the light of this new approach to problems that Kant faced himself. So I think there are a lot of interesting things uh, in doing that. But I don't know. I don't think it's it, it, it's in, it, 
it means that uh, we are I am I'm killing Kent here, but I'm trying to do uh, another thing here. Yeah, I'm trying to do the opposite here and try to show that Kent is uh, very useful uh, today if you are investigating some uh, issues, but uh, you are not doing an exegetical study of Kant, of course. So Kant couldn't uh, see uh, that far. It was impossible for him. I think if, uh, since, the, uh, since the 19th century, we can, we can rethink Kant using, uh, including Darwin, because he, him, as a matter of fact, the, the the passage, the text that uh, made, made me uh, feel, uh, made me reread Kant was a, a text from Darwin. Uh, it's, a, it's a part in the descent of man in, in which he says that uh, the moral consciousness in Kant is the result of a uh, process of evolution. Uh, he called he called Kant there, and he said, "Oh, that, this moral consciousness that Kant is talking about—that's the result of the our uh, evolutionary history." That I I, I I I'm still thinking about that passage of Darwin, so that's that's why I I I think that uh, Darwin was maybe right about that, but Kant was right too, but for reasons that he. That, that were just unknown to him. So I think Kant was right, but the argument to prove uh, what Kant was trying to prove are of a different kind than the arguments he himself used. For example, the factum der Vernunft. Uh, there, there are a lot of discussion about this kind of justification in moral philosophy, but maybe you can use another kind of argument to prove that, yes, we have a moral consciousness, we have an idea of moral law, that's okay, but the foundation is not metaphysical, but you can prove it using another kind of argument. Then you have another kind of uh, objectivity, too. It's not the same kind of objectivity we have in Kant. It's not a, a political, like Kant used uh, uh, used to uh, to try to prove, but it's another kind of objectivity that is contingent. Yeah, of course, that's uh, it, uh, it's not Kantian. Kantian Kant did want did not want it, but but that's a way to prove that he was right using another argument. So I think uh, I think it is. Uh, going to your sec second question, I, I think it, it showed itself useful for us to be moral agents and to see God in nature. I think even in Kant, I think uh, the postulates, they are there because reason works only if it, if it has this kind of idea of a wholeness. So we have, I think we have a lot of presuppositions in Kant's philosophy, just because we need this uh, postulate, for example, in order for our, re our reason to work. Otherwise, uh, I think the reason would collapse if it, it, it doesn't have this, this postulates and this, I, the ideas. I think, I think many things, uh, uh, this kind of ideas or ideals, they are, they are necessary for a well functioning of our reasons. That's why these ideas are there. I think, I think that, uh, that uh, even, uh, even in a theoretical study, I think uh, you can, you can uh, see these ideas as presuppositions, necessary presuppositions in order for our reason to work, to think, and to have no knowledge about nature, uh, for example, uh, how to explain a living being? That that was a problem for Kant. For, for Kant, so he took the idea from Blumenbach of uh, formative power, and then he came. Uh, uh, he uh, he uh, uh, created this idea of a regularity in nature, the purposiveness principle in the third critique, especially because. 
he couldn't explain a living being with, without this uh, regulative principle. Uh, so, in the, uh, the critic of pure reason cannot, uh, couldn't explain those kind of forms. Then he needed to use this kind of. So that's why it, I think uh, many concepts in Kant's uh, philosophy they are just they are just there because reason needs them in order to un to understand nature, and uh, and that's Kantian. I think I, I have some papers about it uh, about the third critique, and I try to explain it using only Kant and the, the more important commentators and interpret interpreters of Kant. But uh, here I'm trying to uh, uh, to show that even these uh, principles that, that, that are transcendental, uh, because uh, Gemüt is the, the uh, set of our faculties that allowed us to know nature and ourselves. And uh, these principles, they are all as that's that's uh, uh, I mean that's a program. It's not a it's not a theory. Uh, it, it, that's something I'm investigating now. But they are they are formed in our relation with nature. If nature were different was was were different, we would be very different beings. We would know using other uh, another uh, kind of. Uh, principles and, uh, and so forth. So uh, I think they are useful, and they uh, that's that's something Kant didn't did not say. But they are useful because using them you, we are uh, a well adapted species only by using them. So they are useful for us. So uh, we are more we are molded this way because it it it's that it. Uh, it was important for us in order for us to be in a well adapted species, but that that uh, Kant couldn't go any further because he didn't have a, an idea of evolution, adaptati adaptativeness, and so forth. So that uh, I have Kant as a background, but I'm trying to explain some of his conclusions with another kind of argument, a natural natural one. But uh, of course, in the end of my paper, I was thinking, uh, uh, I was wonder, wondering about this question: Is this a design we find in nature, or even the design is something that we created ourselves? I, I don't know. That's another. It, it, it leads to another kind of speculation, and uh, of course, can't uh, believe it in the physical theological proof. That's why he, he he tried to reformulate this kind of proof with his uh, principle of finality, uh, finality of purposiveness, uh, because he believed uh, along his life he believed that there, there there is a design in nature that something can always believe, but he couldn't prove it. So that's why he he criticized the proof, the physio, uh, physical theological proof and try to reformulate it uh, in another way in the third critique, using it as a principle of purposiveness. But it's, it's a transcendental reformulation of this old and very, very famous proof at, at his time in the, in the natural theology. But uh, I don't know if I answer your question, but, but I have more questions than <laughs> Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Gemüt, um, mind, 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 Gemüt, uh, they, they translate uh, yeah, Gemüt English, by mind. Yes, in English, he, Mary Gregor and uh, uh, they always translated it as mind. Mind. mind yeah. But you have you you explain it as something that broad. It has a broad me broader meaning than. Sometimes when people yes. speak about mind. Yes, I, I, uh, for example, there is an, an article from Professor Valerio Rodi, you, you both know them, him, uh, in, in which he criticized the English translations because he, 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 did, uh, he was the translator of uh, the, the, the critiques here for Portuguese. And in this article, he criticized the, trans, the, the English translations be, just be, because uh, mind 
uh, is a, uh, has a, uh, a meaning that, that differs from the meaning of gemüt. That's his argument there. But I don't know if uh, you can understand mind with this broader meaning. I think I think he he's, uh, he was very very hard against this translation because. Uh, but he was trying to show that gemüt is not really uh, like uh, some translation for to French, for example, that uses esprit. And is, he was trying to show that the best translation was uh, the the uh, the Latin uh, animus, that, because Kant he, he used to use this this word just just after use gemüt. But uh, but in English, I think that most, the more, I think, I don't know all translations, but the important ones, they translated gamut for us as uh, mind, always. Beck, Camp Smith, Mary Gregor, I, I check it. But it, I think it, but I think it's interesting to, to uh, see that in Kant, mind was, so, so it, uh, it was a broader concept that that uh, 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 corresponds to the set of our faculties, not only the faculty that makes us have more knowledge of nature, but even the faculty that uh, allowed us to to to, uh, to judge nature teleolo teleologically and uh, as, uh, as having a purpose. And uh, as well as to uh, to act morally, because the faculties in the standing, faculty of judge and reason are they are the three faculties are under this concept of gamut, and each faculty has a principle in the in the field of uh, in the field uh, in which it acts, so that. I think it's a, a very broad concept of mind. Uh, I don't know if I have something to say about uh, this. Uh, no. I'm not really. I'm not really sympathetic to the to the approach of trying to to present Kant as a naturalist, but uh, I was talking about he his, wasn't his he wasn't a naturalist <laughs> i'm trying to show that he uh, the point is i'm trying to show that kant the transcendental is compatible with oh, okay. he, he, he himself was not it's possible we can uh, look things uh, in his shoulders and and yeah. then put him back <laughs> in a way let him <laughs> that maybe that's only, the next step. Only use him as a woman, <laughs> <laughs> and not as an end. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know. But uh, on free will, uh, I was thinking about, and I don't know if someone has some question to say because uh, I'm. I want to say some, something more about this. I can wait. I wait. Yeah. So um, first of all, I want to say that I really appreciate what you did, uh, you. showing that um, philosophers don't belong in mu museums, right? Yeah, that's the idea. So, um, but um, that said, I don't necessarily agree with everything you said, but. Um, I wanted to know, it seems that uh, the bridge you try to, to build uh, between Kant and uh, contemporary philosophy was with uh, evolution and embodied cognition, right? My question is, that, uh, do you think that these two are separable, evolution and embodied cognition? Because what, I, I guess what it seems to me is that uh, it could be true that our cognition is embodied, but it didn't. It, it's not a result of evolution. It could, right? It, that's a possibility. But it also, it's also possible that uh, our um, cognitive 
creativity. I don't know if that's the word, but uh, the way we we know and interact with reality evolved, but it's not embodied. You see, so mm -hmm. these two, I, I can see other stories being told where the, these two are not connected. So I'm wondering if if you concede that, if you see that that's possible too, if it's possible that um, evolution and, and, and body cognition are, are not connected. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your yeah. question. I uh, I really believe in the fact of evolution. I think it. I think uh, the environment that I, I, I'm working with this uh, presupposition, so to speak, I, uh, I believe in the fact of evolution. So I believe that uh, the embodiment of our cognition has uh, a, an evolutionary uh, perspective. So I think they are really connected. I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I just believe that uh, the embodiment is the result of the evolution. I don't know what Professor Shapiro has to say about it. I asked about it, about it to, uh, yesterday to him. But I, I, I'm, I have this, it's a, it's a, uh, I, I see the evolution as a fact. So we cannot deny it. Uh, that, uh, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, I don't know. but. But the, uh, the Dar Darwinian arguments are very strong for me, uh, so I, I cannot. Well, some years ago I was a Kantian, and I, I believe the Kantian, Kant, <laughs> the Kantian perspective was a fact. I believed in the fact, fact on their Vernunft, for example. You had no revelation. <laughs> <laughs> but since I'm reading uh, Darwin, some new Dar uh, Darwinians, I, I really believe that evolution is a fact. So I see. In by this, all the, the Dar, Dar, Darwin is a background here too. Uh, it's very important for me because I'm trying to show the embodiment of the transcendental in a Dar, Darwinian perspective, since it is for me a fact. But, but so I, I, I see them as connected. I, I don't see them as possible. Maybe logically possible. It's log logically possible, but it's not real possible for me. Uh, I guess it's just um, cause, did I press it? That's yeah. pretty. Okay, so um, no, I guess what what I'm thinking is just that um, it seems that you're you're what you're trying to do. I guess I guess I understand why the Kantian society would not like your what you're proposing uh, because it seems you're you're proposing maybe two things that not 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 only one thing that is that disagrees with. Kantian scholarship, but two things, right? Darwinian approach and embodied cognition. Yeah. I, I wonder if which is more likely to be accepted by other scholars, by which is which would be more uh, agreeable with Kantian scholarship. Maybe from what you said, it seems that uh, Kant's uh, idea of the mind is not too disconnected from what it's being discussed now with embodied cognition, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know if I made my point clear, but um, I see two different ideas being discussed. One is evolution, okay. which, which um, you know, makes some uh, metaphysical claims about reality, about what exists, and about how things work. And there's another one that's also an epistemological claim about how we get to know things, and how we interact with reality. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think they, they would disagree with this idea of, uh, of an embodiment of, our, of the transcendental. I think they would, would not accept it. Because, you see, uh, this is uh, a great leap I'm doing here uh, from Kant to the, this idea of an embodiment. Because in, uh, usually Kantian scholars, they think Kant is too formal. Our faculties are so formal that uh, it's impossible to see an embodiment there. So you have this kind of uh, formal character, and uh, I think they would disagree that this formal, since it is a formal character, it, it is impossible for them to conceive it as something that is embodied. embodied. So I think they would disagree. If it, 
uh, I was thinking um, is, uh, the camp the scholars, they would even maybe disagree to speak about the brain. Isn't yes. that right? Yes. So, uh, Kantian scholars, uh, so uh, to to naturalize Kant, you 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 don't need necessary to speak about embodiment. You could speak about also a computational, uh, just a computational approach. So uh, it would be um, still an an, an an advanced something new because you would yes. be speaking about yes. the brain. Yes. Isn't that right? Yes, it is. Yes. If you, so even if you use a, a computational uh, uh, analogy, you are going too far from Kant, accordingly to these uh, Kantian scholars. You, you cannot do that. There, there are some philosophers now that are using it. There is a commenter of the first part of Critic of Pure Reason. It's a very important one, I think. It's a recent one. And the author, I forgot his name, but he, he tried to do that. He tried to explain Kant, and he uses some uh, uh, analogies with uh, computational theories. But it's, it's an advance, I think. But it's something very uh, unusual in the Kant fortune. But if you, even if you talk about the brain, you are going too far. That's right. <laughs> I think you, bo you both uh, haven't answered the, answered the question about free will. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying that. So. <laughs> so, uh, and um, Marco, uh, when I, I would ask, so I would ask again, both of you, what do you think of? about what was said yes, say yesterday, because yesterday uh, it was a, a, a human, pers uh, from David Hume's perspective, was, was sustained here. So uh, Kantians used to say that there is something like freedom. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I think I could formulate two questions. One is that, would you say we need uh, this concept of freedom? Is it real? Is it just useful? And I am repeating myself, okay? I will ask Marco again. And also, could we speak from an epiphenomenological perspective, approach, about freedom in a real sense, in a factual uh, sense? Uh, let me, let me an try to answer it and uh, turn again to this uh, point and to the problem of Lisbeth experiment. Uh, first, about Kant. I cannot see Kant except as a libertarian as a philosopher that uh, supports the view that uh, something in our mind, that is, our will, uh, and our good will, is the cause and the only cause, the, un the only cause of our actions, uh, our voluntary actions, uh, have a cause, and its cause is the will, and the will is gamit, uh, uh, and not body. Uh, uh, I cannot see uh, other interpretation of that. Uh, it's simple, of course, it's, it's simple and simplified, uh, but, but that's the, the point. It, uh, uh, usually, uh, and this was, I 
think uh, Larry's uh, question, Lisbeth's experiment usually is interpreted as an argument against the libertarian view of free will, the view that our conscious will uh, has co uh, cause or actions. Okay, and uh, my point is, is this: uh, what uh, what is Lisbeth finding? The problem of uh, scientists is that all uh, uh, experiments or observations or research uh, uh, have findings. Another thing is, is the scientist's interpretation of their findings. Uh, uh, we, can, we can say simply that uh, Lisbeth's findings is that uh, if we have T here uh, in T1, doesn't matter the time, no. We have a brain, even uh, uh, a conscious ex experience of the decision. Uh, so, uh, a mental experience, in my words, and the action. The bodily movement. Bodily movement. And they are uh, situated situated differently in the series of time. And the first one is this, second is this, and third is this. This is findings uh, of Lisbeth uh, experiment. What's the problem? Uh, Lisbeth experiment is a non-controlled experiment. It's simply found it. Uh, but which is the control? He has. So, uh, but he presents an interpretation. His interpretation is uh, here we have a brain event. Uh, uh, it caused, of course, it is antecedent than the bodily movement. Here we have a bodily movement. And so, uh, mental experience is caused by uh, brain event, but the brain event doesn't is the cause of the bodily movement because uh, uh, this uh, is the sufficient to cause bodily movement. But uh, I think this is like this. Well, uh, so it, uh, uh, here we don't have a causal connection. We have only uh, uh, a causal connection between what occurs in the brain and, uh, and what occurs in the mind, the experience. But uh, this is sufficient to cause bodily movements, and we know that. Uh, we know that, that uh, uh, a lot of brain uh, events are sufficient to cause bodily movements. Uh, we can in, uh, simulate it, including this, but well, uh, my uh, what is the libertarian conception? The libertarian conception is something like this. We have brain events. Uh, they cause bodily movements, but we have uh, mind events. And it, it causes uh, uh, bodily movements. Uh, 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 
but the libertarian conception is not quite, uh, uh, well, my point is that uh, the uh, Lisbeth experiment, uh, we don't need Lisbeth experiments findings uh, or uh, exclude or uh, uh, oppose or uh, object to libertarianism. What simply need is the fact that we have brain events and brain events cause our voluntary movements here and are involved to, the, to it. So we don't need uh, uh, this. But my, my point is that uh, the problem of this conception uh, is uh, the, the fact that it is, has an open end that is the, the conception that we have mental experience and mental experience contributes to, to our actions. But, yeah, and, and this is compatible with human compatibilism and determinism. So uh, a human can say uh, we don't need to exclude because for the libertarian we need to exclude brain even as the real cause of the voluntary uh, decisions. We need to uh, accept that a mental even is the cause and it's uncaused. It, 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 it's something that occurs in I don't know, but it caused the movement, uh, bodily movements, uh, voluntary movements, without be, without being caused by uh, something in the brain or in outside, etc. Uh, and so uh, the third, uh, uh, they say that if we accept that something uh, bodily or uh, material contribute to our voluntary movements or uh, uh, we are uh, uh, we are not we are not nor any libertarians uh, we need to accept some kind of compatibilism and so uh, we need to accept that mental experience are not the real uh, cause of our actions uh, but I don't think this is uh, 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 enabled. Uh, this uh, could be enabled, but uh, to prove that it is uh, true, we need a control that shows that this doesn't contribute to our bodily movements, because if we could show that uh, this is always, uh, uh, like I said, Coin uh, ever uh, independent of the time. The, 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 uh, the fact is that ever uh, uh, this kind of brain event occurs, a kind of mental event occurs, and uh, the body, the brain even uh, doesn't cause a bodily movement with, uh, without. Uh, uh, a gemut experience. Uh, we 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 have uh, what we need, and uh, well, that's my point. I think I think that Harry Frankfurt has a a good uh, uh, objection to libertarianism and a good theory about compatibilism. Uh, and this is my point. Uh, my, my point is that the real problem of Lisbeth experiments obviously is not the problem of free will, because the problem of free will is a dead problem. <laughs> the problem is the importance of experience, the causal efficacy of our experience. Uh, the, they are part in our mind. Uh, mind is this. This is mind. Mind is not this. All is this. Mind is this aggregate. Aggregate. This is my point. And mind uh, uh, cause our bodily movements, but mind uh, experience are a part of our mind. Something like this.
So I want to thank you very much, uh, Carlos and Marco, for your talk and for the discussion. I thank the participants. And we have now a break of until 7.30 p.m. And then we come back in here, the same room, for Larry's talk about uh, causal exclusion, okay? So thank you very much.